Welcome back, everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the FIDE World Cup Grand Finals being held in Baku, Azerbaijan. Now, as you guys know, yesterday, Magnus Carlsen and Ramesh Babu Pragnananta drew their first game. It was a fairly peaceful game. Magnus had the black pieces. Today, they face off in game number two. If either player wins, the entire event is over, and one of them will be crowned the champion in the FIDE World Cup. And along with it, they will collect a very cool 128,000 United States dollars. All right, so let's jump right into the action. So we have Magnus with the white pieces, starts with E4, Prague plays E5. No surprises here in a situation where it's a very tense match. You want to try to be as solid as possible. So we get E4, E5, Knight to F3, Knight to C6 from Prague, and now Magnus plays Knight C3. Now this move is a little bit of a bummer to me when I saw it occur on the board, because when I saw this move, this can lead to a couple of different directions, but all roads generally lead to games which end fairly peacefully and without a lot of exciting moves being played. So after knight c3, we get knight to f6, and now Magnus plays bishop to b5. Now, bishop to b5 is one of the two moves that generally are played here. You can play either d4 or bishop b5. Both moves, generally speaking, lead to situations where it's a very stable position. So we get bishop b5, Prague plays knight d4, and now we get knight takes d4 from Magnus. And once I saw this move on the board, I immediately knew what the result was going to be. Now, in this position, if white wants to continue the fight and try to win the game, the best move here is to play the move bishop c4. Black has many options here. You can play for c6 and d5. You can also play the very stable d6 um, or even bishop c5, which is playable here too. Although, actually, now that I think about it, I think bishop c5 is what a certain streamer by the name of Hikaru Nakamura might have played against Vladimir Fedosev in the World Cup in Batumi, Georgia in 2000 and. 17 or 18, I forget the year. And I think he actually lost the game after knight e5 castles and something was like castles, d6, and knight f7. Maybe I've got the exact position slightly wrong, but he did lose a game like this. So Magnus instead decides to trade the knights after pawn takes. He now plays e5. You could move the knight away, but after knight e2, knight takes e4, and knight takes d4. Black has bishop c5 here, putting a lot of pressure on the diagonal immediately. And if you play a move like queen e2 to pin the knight, Black castles out of the threat. If you capture the knight, rookie eight will win this queen, and black will win the game. So Magnus plays e5, Prague takes, we get e takes f6, and now Prague plays the move queen takes f6. Now you're probably wondering, well, can't black take the pawn with check first? Because after bishop takes pawn, queen takes f6. If we do the numerical count, black has uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. So black has one extra pawn here. But the problem with this is that even though black is up a pawn, after white castles, black cannot finish his development. For example, if you play bishop to e7, white goes bishop c3, attacking the queen. And after you play a move like queen g6 to guard the pawn, white now goes rook to e1. You cannot castle without hanging your bishop. If you play king d8, which is a move here, white can sack the rook. And after king takes e7, there's queen e2. King to d8, rook to e1, and suddenly white is crushing because black has one, two, three, four pieces on the back rank. No development whatsoever. And then we would look at this game and think, wait a second, was this a game that was played in the 1850s by Paul Morphy? Or are we living in the year 2023? So c takes d2 is a mistake, which is why Prague captures right away on f6. We get d takes c3 here. Now, this does slightly violate the basic rules, but the reason that Magus captures away from the center while creating the double stack pawns here with this triangle is because he needs to activate this diagonal for his dark square bishop. Most of the time, however, when you do have a chance of getting double pawns, you almost always universally want to capture towards these d and e files. So normally when you're going to get double pawns, you try to capture towards this, the center here versus away from the center like capturing towards this way so magus takes on c3 we get bishop c5 now magus plays queen e2 check prague plays queen to e6 and we get this move bishop f4 now the one danger here for white in this position long term is that because white has taken on c3 with the d pawn white has these double pawns so for example after bishop f4 let's say black were to play c6 bishop a4 takes and d5 you'll notice that black has this nice chain of pawns here white has these double pawns in the center and after say rook d1 bishop e6 black is clearly better due to the pawn structure here in the center of the board so this is the one danger for white now after bishop f4 prague trades the queens magus takes back with the king we get c6 here attacking the bishop also removing the threat of white capturing the pawn 
we get bishop d3 and now Prague plays d5 building his nice chain of three or chain of four connect four I guess you could say and black could be better except Magus has his move c4 getting rid of his double pawns so after c4 is played black cannot really go d4 here because if you play d4 after say a3 castles king to f3 bishop e6 and now b4 white is getting a bit of an advantage here after bishop b6 with moves like rook e1 rook to d1 and potentially playing bishop e5 and c5 trying to pressure this pawn on d4 now again maybe it's still holdable for black but you don't want to go into this because if anybody's trying to win the game it will be white furthermore we are already in an end game here so against the greatest end game wizard of our time magnus carlson that is not what you're hoping for in terms of a slightly worse position so after <clears throat> so after c4 we get d takes c4 from Prague Magnus takes back and already here the position is petering out very quickly Prague plays bishop to f5 here we have the mirrored bishops here but more importantly in this position after rook d1 and castles neither side really has any weakness black is covering the d7 square so white can't create the kebab on the seventh rank Bishop is covering the d6 square and black is going to go rook d8 or rook e8 in the next couple of moves and be because of this reason there's simply very little play here and we already know what the outcome is going to be it's simply a matter of how we arrive at it so Magnus plays bishop d3 Prague plays bishop to e6 now Prague does not trade the bishops here because in this position with the white king being in the center of the board white can potentially try to fight for control over this d file and now without the light square bishop you can no longer prevent the infiltration with rook d7 down the road so we get bishop e6 Magnus goes king to f1 trying to remove the king from the center we get rook to e8 now b3 played rook a d8 rook to e1 now we get h6 here from Prague just a simple move stopping bishop g5 maybe creating some look for the king down the road on h7 at any rate it's just a move to play not like there's any great reason but it makes sense so we get rook a d1 now king to f8 played by Prague Magnus goes f3 we get bishop to b4 rook e4 bishop c5 and now Magnus plays rook e one now if Magnus really wanted to force a draw immediately he probably could have played rook four to e1 and we would have gotten this very strange repetition instead Magnus goes rook d to e1 Prague plays bishop d5 and now all the rooks come off the board here after bishop to f5 we get the swap and now king to e7 Magnus is not in time to try and sneak him from behind with bishop c8 because after b6 bishop b7 black can just simply go king d7 guarding the pawn and if c4 there's bishop to e6 and if anybody is better here it probably is black so Magnus goes c4 we got bishop to e6 being played here bishop takes bishop king takes bishop Magnus plays h3 here putting all his pawns on the opposite color of the star square bishop unfortunately for Magnus Prague can do the same thing here he plays h5 king to e2 g6 and now that the players have reached move number 30 a draw is agreed upon according to rules and regulations players cannot agree to a draw in this event before black's 30th move but in this position they agree to a draw because essentially what's going to happen is we're going to reach a position like this where all the pawns from both sides are on the opposite colors of their bishops and neither side can do anything at all so draw is a very reasonable result now obviously this is very disappointing for you guys the fans to see such a quick draw in the second game however we do have to keep in mind that the players have been playing for a very long time both of these players have been, now been in Baku Azerbaijan for nearly one month they've been playing pretty much every day with the exception of a couple of rest days and both players I think are exhausted at this point point. and in the case of Magnus Carlsen he also has been struggling with food poisoning as well it was very clear from the interviews he's low energy not feeling very well so he simply decides that he'd rather take his chances in the rapid and or potentially blitz tiebreak that could occur tomorrow so while it's a bummer it's very understandable from both players point of view so we have a tiebreaker in the match between Magus Carlson and Ramesh Babu Pragnanta let's take a look at the constellation match between Fabiano Caruana and Nijat Abbasov now as we know Fabiano got smoked like some hot bread I don't know I was thinking of bread or dough but I was um Fabiano got crushed yesterday by Abasov in a very very brutal game he lost I believe in 24 moves with the black pieces to go down 1-0 in the match or go down 0-1 and today he's coming back in game two with the white pieces if he does not win this game he will finish in fourth place in the FIDE World Cup so let's jump right into the action so Fabiano plays e4 on move number one and now Abasov plays c5 knight to f3 and e6 now I'm not going to really be overly critical about Abasov's opening opening choice obviously he's had a lot of success throughout the event with the Sicilian but in this situation it's very clear to me that Abasov needs to make some changes and more than just the World Cup 
I would strongly suggest that Abisov starts playing something a little bit more solid in the Canada's tournament, which he has qualified for due to the lack of Magnus Carlsen's participation. Because if he tries to play openings like he played, like he's played throughout the World Cup, I have a feeling it's going to be a very long and difficult event for him. So we get the Sicilian, we get d4, takes, takes. Now we get knight to c6. This is the classic Taimana variation. We get knight c3 from Fabiano, knight to f6. And now Fabiano plays the move bishop to f4. Now, this move is a little bit surprising from Fabiano. Most people here play the move knight takes c6, pawn takes knight in e5, knight d5, and knight to e4 here, trying to take advantage of the lack of development as well as the Swiss cheese here, where white has this great hole on d6 to stick the knight. Now, this has been played a lot in both the World Cup as well as in the Women's World Cup. There have been many games in this variation. And I suspect that Fabiano, playing against Abisov, who clearly had prepared this opening for the event, simply wanted to take a different path. So Fabiano plays bishop to f4, and now we get this shocking move, bishop b4, from Abasov. Now, once again, it's very clear this was a preparation for the tournament, but it's really surprising that Abasov plays this move instead of the more standard d6. Knight d to b5, attacking the pawn, e5, bishop g5, and a6, which would transpose back into the classic Shveshnikov Sicilian. Usually, we get this position from a different move order. Normally, it comes out of this order, where you get the d4, takes, knight f6, knight c3, e5, knight b5, d6, bishop g5, and a6. So normally, we get this order, so it's very surprising that Abasov chooses not to do this. Instead, he plays bishop b4, and now Fabiano plays knight b5, trying to play knight c7, forking the king and the rook. Here, Abasov plays move knight takes e4, and it's already very clear, even though I don't play this variation, that we're in a super sharp line that is move by move. And in a game where Abasov only needs a draw to clinch third place, it's fairly inexcusable, in my opinion, to go into this line simply because we're in a situation where if Black does not know every correct move, you can just lose immediately where it's not even a game where Fabian is prepared and has looked at with Stockfish before the game. He might not have to find any moves over the board. And anytime you're playing against another opponent, if you get outplayed and you lose a game, that's one thing. But if you lose out of the opening because your opponent was able to prepare with Stockfish or any of the other engine programs, you, that's just simply not a very good feeling because they didn't have to do anything to beat you. So I was very shocked to see knight takes e4. We get queen to f3 from Fabiano here, and now Abasov plays the move d5. Now, if Abasov were to trade the knights on c3 after takes, b takes c3. If black plays bishop to a5 here, now white has knight to d6 check, king to f8, and after castles, white has a very big advantage. Black is struggling to develop the queen side pieces. Your king is here, so you can't castle either. White is probably already very, very close to winning. So we get d5 instead from Abasov, which, by the way, to be clear, as far as I understand, is the best move. Uh, Fabiano plays knight c7 check, forking the king and the rook. We get king to f8, and now castles. Now, up to this point, all these moves coming in pretty much instantly from Fabiano. We get bishop takes c3, played after a short thing. B takes c3, and now the move queen e7. Now, to give you an example of just how insane this whole position is here, after king f8 castles, at least according to my weak computer, in this position after b takes c3, the weak engine on chess.com suggests that black plays e5, knight takes d5, this move f5 to guard the knight on e4, and after white plays a move like bishop g3, the very obvious and human-looking move, pawn to h5, is the best move here. Now, again, this is an insane move for a human to play here because there are all kinds of forks and, and um, discovered attacks here. For white with the rook and the knight, your king's not developed, what are you doing pushing pawns on the edge of the board? But the computer says this is the best way to play the position. Now, once again... In a situation where you only need a draw to win the match, trying to play something like this to me just seems completely insane. Because if you don't know these best moves, there's a very good chance you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. So instead, Abasov plays queen to e7 here. Fabiano plays the move c4. Fabiano does not capture this rook on a8 here because after queen to a3 check, you cannot run to d2 because of the knight. And after king b1, knight takes c3. If you go king a1, queen takes a2 is checkmate. And after queen takes knight, queen takes queen. Black is simply winning in this position with an extra queen for a rook and a bishop. So Fabiano plays c4 instead, which is an excellent move. It covers the a3 square. No check here. Now you're putting a lot of pressure on the pawn on d5 and black center, and the rook on a8 is still hanging. So here Abasov plays the move queen to f6. Now this move is played relatively quickly, and after c3 we get g5. Now these moves are played, in, as I said, in a relatively quick manner of speaking. I'm not sure whether this was still Abasov's prep or whether he's trying to recall variations what was going on. But at this point, Abasov is already very close to losing in this game. Now, this position, 
Computer likes a very counterintuitive move, queen to e7, or not queen e7, sorry, pawn to e5 here. And after I think knight takes a8, there's something like queen takes f4, which is very murky, although maybe c takes d5 is just winning. Or no, c takes d5, e takes f4, d takes c6, and after knight c3, I guess computer says c takes b7, takes king b1, knight c3 is very, very unclear. Again, I have no idea what's going on here after king c2, bishop f5, bishop d3, and then rook d8. It's a very, very weird position here because basically black has no development. The king of the rook are here. White has a pawn on the seventh rank, but according to the computer, this is zero. So like black is actually completely fine in this position. Now, again, how realistic is this to find over the board? I think it's borderline impossible, which I suspect is why Fabiano chose this line in the first place. Because he figured that if Abbasov knew this line to this point, so be it. That happens. Preparation is a thing. But if Abbasov doesn't know this, Abbasov probably will just lose the game. And this is one of the greatest feelings in the world in chess is when you play something that you prepare, and it's a 50-50, where if your opponent knows the absolute best moves, they will draw the game. But if they don't, it's just an easy free win. Now, I actually have, have had this happen to me on many occasions, but probably the most famous one was when I played Sergei Karyakin from Russia in the Zurich Chess Challenge, I believe in 2014. I could have the year wrong, but I played a variation in the English opening where with the white pieces where black has to sacrifice a piece. Now, if black sacrifices a piece and sacrifices a second piece, it leads to a long king walk where there's a repetition of moves and the game is a draw. But if you don't know that you just sack the second piece and you can't work out the calculations over the board, you probably won't play it and you'll probably lose. And that is exactly what happened when I played Karyak. And he was not able to remember the line. It wasn't obvious over the board what the correct variation was. And when you get free wins like that, it's a great feeling. So I suspect that Fabiano at this point after G5 was played was feeling really, really good about himself because he spent some time and he knew this could not be the correct continuation. So we get bishop to D6 check here, king G7. You cannot take the bishop because then you hang the queen on F6. So king G7 is played. We get queen takes queen, king takes queen, knight takes rook, knight takes bishop, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn. And now Fabiano finds the all-star move pawn to F3. Now this move is by no means obvious there are a couple of other moves that look much more much more obvious such as knight c7 but after knight e4 knight takes d5 king g7 suddenly white actually has a lot of problems here because pawn and f2 is hanging if you push i fork the rooks and so essentially you're gonna have to move your rook and give up this pawn and in a position like this after rookie two and bishop f5 computer does not think that white is actually all that much better because black has active pieces king's a little bit weak there's rook c8 to put pressure on the pawn and overall black has great drawing chances Additionally, knight, on top of knight 7, rook takes d5 is another move that's very obvious. But after knight to e4, if you play f3 here, now I can go knight takes c3, and I hit the rook in the pawn. Your knight is still stuck in the corner, and it's very, very tricky to play. So Fabiano uses a little bit of time, but he finds the all-star move f3, which stops knight to e4. And now white simply wants to bring the knight back to c7, win the pawn on d5, and with it, win the game. And the computer already says here that this is close to winning for white. It's better by almost two points. And so Fabiano is on cruise control. He's, he's already up in exchange in a must-win game with the white pieces. What more can you ask for? So we get knight to f5 here by Abisov. Fabiano plays knight c7. We get pawn to d4 here, and now Fabiano makes a fairly serious inaccuracy by playing the move bishop to b5. Now, in this position, what Fabiano should have done is he simply should have taken the pawn on d4, because after black takes back, let's say knight c takes d4, you can simply go g4, attacking the two knights here, and black is struggling. And if black takes with the f knight, knight f takes d4, you can simply go bishop c4, followed by rook hg1 and king b2, and white is well on his way to victory. Instead, Fabiano plays bishop b5, which on first glance actually makes a lot of sense. Because if black were to take the pawn on c3 here, you can trade the bishop for the knight and then go rook e1 here. And the knight on f5 is actually kind of blunted. You can't really move it towards any of these squares on the e or d files. And white will go king c2, king takes c3. Bishop also can't get into the game. So because of the bishop and the knight here, white is actually very close to winning. But what Fabiano actually missed, I suspect, during the game is that after bishop to b5, black can play his move black and black can play this move knight to e3 now additionally let's say black were to play a6 this is also why bishop b5 makes sense you trade and take the pawn on d4 and you're simply winning the game but the problem with bishop b5 is that now after knight to e3 is played we get rook to d2 black can play this tricky move bishop d7 and now black is threatening to go rook c8 and win the horse on c7 because you no longer have the knight jump back to d5 now the computer thinks actually that at this point it's actually very close to being a draw with perfect play which goes to show first of all just how strong computers are but secondly how many resources exist in the game of chess and how even one move that looks innocuous like bishop b5 can actually potentially 
lead from a win to a draw now additionally the reason that this bishop on b5 is misplaced is because it also takes away the square from the knight on b5 so a very logical seeming move like bishop b5 turns into a serious mistake so here Fabiano goes rook to e1 we get rook to c8 rook takes knight rook takes knight if black were to capture the rook after rook takes bishop white has an extra bishop and should win the game very soon so we get rook takes c7 Fabiano plays rook to e4 and now we get this move d takes c3 now this is a big mistake from Abasov up to this point he's been playing an amazing game and I do believe here that if Abasov had played this move bishop to e6 he probably would have drawn the game now the computer still gives white a big advantage because after takes takes and rook d4 rook c3 king b2 white has a rook for a bishop and a pawn but I do believe that after this move rook to c5 with black having the two on one on the queen side and this very very stable very very stable king side here with the pawns like say h6 g5 bishop glued to the e6 square black I think would draw this game in fact I think if I had this against a computer with the white pieces I would almost never win this so bishop to e6 would have been the best move but instead Abasov plays the move d takes c3 which is a serious mistake because now after rook to d6 king g7 and the move rook to e3 black is no longer going to be able to force a trade of the bishop for the knight now one thing in, in, in an end game like this let's just say white were to take here for example to illustrate another point is that if black can ever get the, the bishop anchored here on c6 you can never remove this bishop it's anchored by the pawn you, you'd love to put this a pawn like on d5 or b5 but again you can't put it it's on the edge of the board you can't get any closer to the center so the bishop is just permanently anchored here and you're not gonna have any chances to win so you know so when we look at end games you know that there are certain structures certain piece placements that you want to avoid if possible and for Fa Fabiano here the main thing is you do not want to trade this Bishop if you can help it unless it's under favorable circumstances so that's why in this position Bishop e6 would have been better because white actually would have had a trade so if you take on d4 there's knight takes d4 winning the Bishop and if you move the King for example to b2 maybe you can play this move but still after a move like a6 again you're gonna have to take on c6 and in this position I think your white would be very very hard pressed to win I don't think Fabiano would win the game if Bishop e6 had been played but at last we are humans Abasov plays d takes c3 we get check King g7 not Bishop e6 by the way because now after takes takes rook a4 white is simply going to win the game by bringing the King up and taking the pawn on c3 your pawns are now split so they're both very weak and white long term can even do something like this for example with rook a3 trying to win the pawn on a7 so we get King g7 rook e3 now a6 is played and now Bishop a4 now rook e3 was an excellent move here by Fabiano computer actually likes rook d5 more because after h6 you can go rook c5 but the one move to avoid here is rook to c4 trying to win the pawn and pin the knight because now after a6 you have to trade and we end up in this end game again where black has this bishop guarded by the pawn and if you try to avoid it with bishop a4 now there's b5 which forks the bishop and the rook and black is actually better now so you have to be very very careful and when Fabiano plays rook e3 we get a6 bishop to a4 the dust is starting to settle here Fabiano will win this pawn on c3 the pin is still alive and at this point it's looking very dire for Abasov so here Abasov plays the move bishop e6 now Fabiano trades takes on c3 and now after bishop takes a2 rook c6 Fabiano has gotten exactly what he what he wanted because even though black has a bishop and a rook on the board all of the pawns have come up on the queen side so now it's simply three versus three so with two rooks and three pawns versus a rook bishop and three this should be winning so we get rookie two rook d2 rookie one now next set of moves there's not really a whole lot to explain because basically what Abasov does is he tries to set this up with a wooden shield on e6 bishop is guarded by the pawn which is very very important and now it's up to Fabiano to find a way to push some pawns and create weaknesses around the black king it's also important to note that after say rook d6 rookie five king c2 rook b5 if white ever sacks here on e6 even though white has an extra pawn with the three versus two all on the same side of the board this is a technical draw so we get rook a1 rook e5 next set of moves not really relevant so I'll just keep skipping forward Fabiano slowly brings his king over to the king side we get this position here where Fabiano plays king g3 we get king to f6 and now rook to e2 is played here the main point at the up to up to this point is that Fabiano has gotten his king over to the king side so now the king is on the king side at some point you're gonna have to play for f4 h4 now there is one other idea that is actually winning in a couple moves which I will show you which is after bishop f5 white can play this very unusual idea with rook e8 because if black tries to go bishop e6 here you have rook h8 king to g7 and now you have rook a to a8 creating the double stack on the back rank and creating the power coupling and here if black plays a move like rook c4 after rook a g8 king f6 rook takes h6 white will win a pawn and win the game now surprisingly Fabiano was not able to spot this tactic instead he plays rook e5 
bishop g6 we get rook b5 and Abasov, I think in this position put the bishop on g6 specifically because I think he realized there's going to be a problem with the rooks infiltrating from the back rank so he goes bishop g6 instead we get rook b5 rook c4 check king g7 rook b5 basically a bunch of waiting moves here rook b4 rook c5 rook b5 rook c2 rook b5 and finally in this position after rook a2 we get h4 here from Fabiano now the point with the bishop being on g6 is that here black basically is arguing that the bishop will, is anchored by the pawn on f7 and if you need to you can always play h5 and create this nice set of three additionally these ideas around the back I don't think they work as well because after bishop f5 rook b8 black can simply play a move like bishop h7 stopping rook g8 and if you go rook h8 I just wait forever on the second rank because you can't play rook to g8 check so Abasov very creatively puts the bishop on the g6 square and I think the reason he did this is because I think he realized that white would be able to bring the rooks around the back because otherwise in this position it would have made a lot of sense for Abasov um to simply put the bishop back on e6 because I think if white does not go for this idea with the rooks to a and h8 after rook b8 say white plays h4 I think this position is still very very tricky to win for white after rook to b3 so at any rate we keep going we get to this position here where we have h4 being played now Abasov trades and we get h5 being played here so what Abasov is arguing is that now he has the bishop supported supported by the two pawns rook on the second rank keeping an eye on the pawn on g2 and how can white progress now the most important thing for Fabiano here is to not trade pawns for example if you get a position like king f4 g4 takes takes and rook a2 this is a theoretical draw here white cannot win the only way white can win here is if you can somehow remove this bishop from g6 so Fabiano's goal here has to be to try to push the pawn to f5 because it's the only way to get rid of this bishop for example just to illustrate another point say you get this this position um just to show you guys if, if you get some position like this again the pawn is on g2 you can never get the pawn to f5 or h5 to remove the bishop so the bishop is just permanently planted on the square and if you can't remove it it's an instant draw and this would be a draw to be clear so Fabiano goes rook before we get rook c2 f4 played king to f6 now this is a fatal blunder maybe not fatal blunder because it's not the move that loses the next move loses but it makes the next move for Abasov borderline impossible which he doesn't find in this position black should actually just play rook to a2 and after f5 bishop h7 it's actually very difficult for white to win this now I know Cessna says somewhere around here there's some way for white to win this end game but when I was looking at the, at this live while I was streaming on kick I simply could not find the clear win basically there's some way where white can win this without pushing f5 if white ever goes f5 and we get bishop h7 this is very close to a draw because after rook b6 and rook to a4 you can never push the pawn forward because then black will get this same setup where the bishop on g6 again cannot be removed because now the pawn can't go back to f5 to attack it since you push it up the board and I think already here after rook a4 this is very close to a draw because if you play a move like king h3 there's rook to f4 and your pawn at f5 is very very weak out of thin air so this would have been very interesting to see how Fabiano proceeds after um after uh, rook to a2 but instead Abasov plays king f6 now king to h6 is the other move that I would have liked to have seen because after rook to b6 and king g7 here the computer thinks that white is winning but again I don't know exactly what the technique is because if f5 bishop h7 ever occurs we're right back where we were a couple of moves before and there's no clear way to make progress but by going king f6 this allows Fabiano to play rook to g5 and now the window is so small there is only one move here which does not lose the game on the spot and after playing for five plus hours Abasov is unable to find the correct move now in this position the big threat here is rook to b6 so say you go rook c8 rook b6 check king g7 there's now f5 the bishop is pinned and after king h6 king to h4 guarding the rook you can try to check with rook c4 but after g4 it's gg why not because you simply will lose the bishop on the g6 square so with that in mind king g7 of course also loses to f5 as well after king h6 king h4 no check on c4 bishop h7 rook takes h5 ends the game so you have to be really really careful and as I said after playing for five hours at this point Abasov simply can't find the move now after rook to c1 amazingly the game is not over because when white plays rook b6 if you go king g7 and f5 there's this move king to h6 and the rook on g5 is actually trapped you can't go back to g4 now you could sack obviously but you can't keep the rook on the board without giving it up and if you were to play king to h4 now there's rook to h1 check which basically it's still a draw but after king g3 king takes g5 takes takes black is the one up upon and trying to win and his most important most important point about this is that rook c4 again would lose to g4 as well now 
as I said almost impossible to play rook c1 with time winding down very difficult after playing for five plus hours but after rook c1 it's not completely clear how white white is winning the game I think the computer is saying white should go back to d5 and after say rook to c2 you basically reset this position and eventually it's winning but like I said I'm not I'm not going to go through those super long lines in fact when I was looking at Sessa, none of the lines seem super obvious anyway and I really do wonder if Fabiano would have been able to win the game if Abasov had simply seen the idea of playing this rook c1 move now again you're probably wondering well why did I say king h6 was better the reason is because if king h6 rook b6 is played you do not have options you only have one move f5 is a threat to win the bishop you can't go to h7 because f5 traps the bishop and so because of that you're in a situation where if you put the king on h6 your next move is instant you have no other moves to play and when you only have one move you're obviously going to find it but here after king to f6 rook g5 in this position rook c1 is not an obvious move you're very worried about rook b6 and f5 and and so in this position Abasov plays a move that I think most people including myself would have played if we'd been playing for five hours which is a very natural move rook to c6 stopping the rook b6 f5 idea but now after king to h4 the game is effectively over here because now the problem is white has a very active king the rook on g5 is well placed and f5 is coming on the next turn uh basically forcing the bishop to move from the g6 square either to capture or drop back but at any rate it's game over as we'll see because after rookie six we get f5 takes and now the important point is now white besides having that rook b6 idea you can laterally move the rook to f4 pinning the bishop on f5 and after we get rook to e5 king not king takes h5 sorry rook takes h5 Abasov resigns the game here because after king to e6 g4 bishop g6 takes takes and king g5 white is simply winning if you go king e6 I can sack the rook and this king and pawn end game is simply winning so I push the pawn all the way up the board and get a queen furthermore just to illustrate another point here even if you could get king e6 and say rook b4 king e7 this is still winning for white because after rook b7 if you go king f8 there's king to f6 followed by rook to b8 winning but it's important to note that if you were if black were able to get the king to g7 this is actually a theoretical draw because you can always just yo-yo with the bishop on all these squares on the diagonal and you never move this king from the g7 square and the white king can't get in so this would have been this 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 unfortunately can't happen and, and so after rook h5 Abasov does simply resign the game the match is now tied 1-1 both players will be playing tie breaks tomorrow as I reiterate at the start of this video there are a couple things that are on my mind first of all Abasov definitely should not have played this opening in a situation where he only needed a draw but my strong suspicions that Abasov had prepared this opening for the tournament he felt like he might as well you know live by the sword die by the sword play what he had prepared but I also think that that Abasov probably was riding the, riding a very serious high he crushed Fabiano with the white piece yesterday he's been having a dream run almost beat Magus in their first game as well and I think probably the overconfidence and and all this all the emotions and everything else going on probably led him and led him trying to be principled and play what he had prepared but it was ultimately a very very bad decision and I do hope that he prepares some other exciting openings for the candidates tournament at any rate you guys that means we have two tiebreakers both Fabiano and Magnus are playing tomorrow of course I will be doing a recap after after their rapid rapid and or blitz tiebreak but at any rate I hope you guys have enjoyed this video make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already and I will be back very soon with another recap see you guys bye